Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the RQMP uh, Fall Seminar Series. Uh, I'm glad to see so many people from our three institutions, uh, McGill, UDM, and Sherbrooke. Uh, we have an exciting program. You can now see it um, in the various institutions that we're, um, we're advertising, but it's going to also appear on the RQMP website, so you have all the information. We'll meet um, every Thursday at 10.30, like we did in the summer, uh, and we have a really good line of speaker, and here is the first. Uh, and the host is Kartik Agarwal from McGill, who's going to introduce our speaker. Kartik, take it on. Right. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely a pleasure to have today Sid Permishwan with us. So um, Sid uh, obtained his uh, PhD in 2011 uh, from Princeton, working on, among other things, uh, quantum hall physics and multivalent systems. Uh, he then moved on to do a postdoc at Berkeley, where he did some really exciting stuff with topological semi-metals uh, and uh, many-body localization. Um, after that, he moved uh, to UC Irvine as a professor, and I think just recently, maybe a year ago, he's been uh, at Oxford. Um, and uh, so I worked with uh, Sid personally, and the one thing I can say about him is that he's maybe one of the most, if not the most, <laughs> excitable and enthusiastic people I know. Uh, he's always thinking and always uh, doing some new physics. And, uh, and the other thing is that he is one of those uh, theorists who's extremely experimentally minded. So he likes to really derive, uh, uh, you know, theory from directly from experimental data, which is, I think, a very admirable quantity, uh, quality in today's times. So I think today what we're going to hear is also going to be something at least with some basis in experiments. And I really look forward to, to hearing Sid. Um, all right, so uh, you will have uh, an hour, Sid, and I can tell you at around the 10 minute mark uh, or 15 minute mark, so you can start wrapping down uh, in five minutes for questions. Right? I'm, I'm actually happiest to have be interrupted for questions because there's some natural points where it's easy to break for questions. Okay, yeah. So I'll pause a little, a beat longer than I normally would because uh, my experience is in Zoom. Everybody has to ask a question once, realize they're on mute, then ask the question again. So uh, maybe waiting a little extra will be helpful. So thanks, Karthik, for that very kind, uh, over generous introduction there. Uh, it does feel very recently that I moved to Oxford, but shockingly, I woke up a week ago and realized I'd been here for three years, not just a year, which is some, it seems a bit terrifying. So I've been here now three years. Um, it's a great pleasure to give the seminar. I've actually was hoping to visit Karthik uh, sometime in this coming year as part of coming to North America again to visit friends. So unfortunately, it'll have to be a remote, but I'm uh, glad that uh, you know very active and interesting seminar series like these are going on all over the place. So I hopefully, in some ways, the world will seem smaller because of this. So um, as Karthik said, the talk I'm going to uh, what I'm going to talk about today is work that's sort of tied to experiments. So. Um, but I'm trying to think a little bit about uh, experiments that link the symmetry and topology of, you know, we've heard those phrases a lot in organizing systems. But what I'm focusing on in this experiment, uh, what you'll find in this talk is it's talk talking about symmetry and topology as applied to the excitations of some complicated ground state. And so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the ideas of symmetry and topology allow us to understand properties of the excitation spectrum. And maybe there are new insights to be learned there. So. Before going forward, I should say that the talk is basically in two parts, and the, uh, and the people doing most of the heavy lifting in this work are uh, predictably really bright students, so I should particularly flag them, Michele Fava and Eve Squan. They're both, uh, you know, halfway through their PhDs, but in a couple of years, we'll be looking for postdocs, so I encourage anybody who's uh, interested in really enthusiastic and bright people to work with. They're really fantastic. Um, the first piece of physics is a sort of story in quantum magnetism, and that was done in collaboration with my experimental colleague, Radu Koldea, who's a neutron scatterer. And the second uh, piece of work uh, is a little bit more speculative. It's a pure theory idea, but building or motivated by some really beautiful experiments on graphene Moiré systems. And that was done with my postdoc, Yi Chen Hu, and my colleague, Steve Simon, in the theory group. So, as motivation, I want to focus today on quasi-particles, but quasi-particles of correlated systems. And the reason I'm interested in them is that quasi-particle excitations 
in essence carry the, an imprint of the correlated ground states. There's a link between an interesting correlated ground state and its quasi-particle excitations. This is sort of part of the standard triptych of ideas that Anderson introduced, for instance, in broken symmetry. There's generalized rigidity. There's a certain quasi-particle structure, things like Goldstone modes. And so that's the reason to focus on quasi-particles, because often they control the low energy dynamics of the problem. But they're also often a setting where symmetry and topology can interact in interesting ways. So there are classic example of these. So for instance, in a picture where you think about broken symmetries, um, so think about magnetism, very often you're interested in topological defects of the broken symmetries. For instance, domain walls in an Ising model are topologically stable objects or vortices in an XY model. Conversely, um, when we talk about topology, we have lots of interesting exotic fractionalized states of matter. But typically when one talks about fractionalized states, the most obvious things to fractionalize are quantum numbers associated with symmetries. So it may not often be said this way, but if you think about the quantum Hall effect, the, possibly the most famous fractionalized phase where you see fractional charges, um, you have an E over three quasi-particle, for instance, at the nu equals one third quantum Hall state. But in order for, that, for there to be a notion of fractionalization, you need a global charge conservation symmetry in order to be able to assign charges to particles. And so fractionalization is often most manifest when you have a symmetry. So the sort of interplay of symmetry and topology will be a theme in what I'm gonna talk about today. But specifically, what I want to do is think, unpick this idea with two sort of simple stories. And if you think about broken symmetry, the simplest example of a broken symmetry is an easing chain uh, in one dimension. And so I'm gonna talk about the broken symmetry states, which are domain walls and spin flip quasi particles in a 1D easing magnet. And the second part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the simplest topological phase and talk about its broken symmetries. Uh, and in particular, I'll focus on integer quantum Hall states in Moray systems of graphene. So the rough balance is about two thirds of the talk will focus on the first bit, which is befitting something that's an experimental fact. And I'll allow myself the luxury of theoretical speculation for the last roughly one third of the talk. So to jump right in, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is in this uh, preprint, and it's about the story of thinking about various properties of quasi-particle excitation in a quasi 1D Ising system, which is this complicated chemical compound, cobalt neobate. So this is a material that is a 1D system but it's of course, as a real material, it's not a single, you know, the only 1D real systems that you can think about are things like carbon nanotubes. This is a real material that I'm doing, uh, people do neutron scattering on. So what it really is, is a triangular lattice of 1D ferromagnetic easing chains. So you have a lattice of zigzag CO2 plus ions. So these blue dots here surrounded by oxygen octahedra. And after the usual conspiracy of um, various couplings, you find that the low energy effective physics is that there's very strong couplings along the chain. Now, zigzag chains like these uh, stick out along the C-axis of the system, where, and in the AB plane, if you look down the C-axis of the AB plane, you see a triangular lattice. It's really a lattice of isosceles, uh, isosceles triangles, not perfectly symmetric triangular lattice. But basically, you should think of it as a weakly coupled triangular array of 1D easing chains. And so, the leading Hamiltonian along the chain turns out to be uh, a ferromagnetic easing model. Uh, it turns out if you go back and do some microscopic calculations, you find that these are not Kramer's doublet. These are non-Kramer's doublets. So there's all kinds of complicated terms that you can write down. But the leading physics is really just something that looks like a standard easing model. J, J, uh, and I'm going to use the convention that the transverse field, so this is an externally applied transverse field, which the experimentalists can control. And I'm going to Put that along the y-axis because it just makes some notation easier later. And so the overall Ising coupling of this problem is, is just a flip of z to minus z, which is basically act, act with everything by e to the i pi sy on the system. This is just sort of setting up notation. That's why I'm going into this level of detail. Now, the the complication of this system is that it's not a single isolated 1D chain. It's actually a thermodynamically large number of stacked 1D chains. So every chain is an environment of neighboring chains. So you need to somehow treat the two dimensionality. And it turns out a very good approximation is to treat the two dimensionality in a mean field way. So the way to think about this problem is think of this as a 1D easing chain. This 1D easing chain is going to uh, order. If 
uh, the usual phase quantum phase transition of the 1D transverse field easing model. It turns out when it orders, SZ develops a non-zero expectation value. That's going to be true of all the nearby chains, and that leads to a self-consistent effective field that wants two neighboring chains to align in the same direction. So there's some interchain coupling that wants uh, a chain. So if I have a triangular lattice of chains, so you have something like this. Once uh, one chain orders, I'm not drawing this very well, excuse me. Um, once this chain orders, it's going to influence all the neighbors. So there's going to be some effective ordering on the chains. And so that's the uh, situation. So that's captured by this term here, which is essentially something I put in phenomenologically and experimentally this would have to be determined, but you can just imagine that in the ordered phase, there's a longitudinal field that switches on. So if you like, when in the paramagnet, there's no HZ coupling, but the minute you go into the ferromagnetic phase, there's an HZ coupling. And of course, if you really want to solve the 3D transition, you have to do this uh, in a kind of self-consistent way and you'll get a true 3D easing transition, but that's not really my focus over here. In fact, I'll say very little about the critical point in, any, uh, in this talk. So if I just take the 1D model and not worry too much about this HZ term, well, this is the canonical quantum critical point in one dimension. It has a quantum critical point at zero temperature. It's tuned by HY. And the things that you need to know is that in the system, the gap, the 1D, in a 1D system, the gap closes at the transition. And you go from an ordered phase where all the spins align to, uh, parallel to each other, but then break a symmetry because they can choose to align either up or down to a phase where the spins just align along the field. And going back to the focus of quasi-particles being the main thing we're thinking about here, the two different types of quasi-particles are domain walls between the two Ising ferromagnetic uh, domains, so all up and all down, there's a domain wall between them. So that's the natural quasi-particle in the ordered phase. Whereas in the disordered or paramagnetic phase, the natural excitation is, the lowest energy excitation is to take a single spin and make it point opposite to the applied field instead of along the applied field. Those are the natural excitations of the system. So the nice thing about those excitations is that they are visible directly in inelastic <laughs> neutron scattering. Yeah, Karthik? I have a simple question. So the axis, um, the Ising uh, Z axis, is it yeah. the same as the C axis? Or? Uh, there's no particular relationship between those axes. It is, uh, I'm just calling them C because, you know, it's an internal symmetry. There's some, there's some spin orbit that rotates these things a little bit. So I'm not going to co connect those directly. You're right that Z and C are closely related, but they're not precise. They're not necessarily precisely the same. There can be some slight rotations, but I'm just going to treat the spin as internal. And right. the, you know, I'm going to ignore, I'm going to put in spin orbit, then define axes and then forget about it, if that makes sense. Okay. Perfect. It's a great question, but I'm not getting into that. That's why you get a lot of other stuff. These are non kramers so There's a whole bunch of other terms I'm going to discuss in a second. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we can measure, what the experimentalists can measure most easily is excitations of the system. And the way they do that is do look at the two, they scatter polarized neutrons off the system and look at excitations by looking at the dynamic spin structure factor. And essentially that's the Fourier transform of the two point space time correlation function of spin operators. So you have S alpha I at T correlation function with S beta J at time T equals zero. And you Fourier transform that in the positions of separation between the two sites of measurement and in the time between the two measurements and you get the structure factor as a function of omega and k. And the reason this is interesting, this is nice is because there's a sharp distinction, at least at the leading Ising level between the disordered phase. So in the disordered phase, the spin flips are good quasi-particle excitations. And since you're measuring essentially a correlation function of spin flips, S of k omega, you should see a sharp mode. So if you look at a, a color map of S of k and omega, you should see that there's sharp peaks along one particular line and that's just the, classic dispersion curve of the spin flips. So it should look like a cosine K dispersion at leading order because it just looks like a single particle hopping problem. It's a little bit more complicated in the ordered phase. So in the ordered phase, what you naturally do is create a spin flip, but a spin flip on its own can actually decay into a pair of domain walls because, a spin, uh, because the point is that a spin flip is not a stable quasi-particle. The natural excitations are domain walls. So a spin flip is just a state of two domain walls so they can propagate separately. So this will not give you a sharp mode because 
having pumped a spin flip into the system, uh, having created a spin flip, there are many ways I can take my budget of Q of K and omega and distribute it among those two domain walls. I can give more momentum and more energy to one than the other. So what I couple to is the two quasi-particle continuum in the ordered phase, right? So in fact, that's roughly what I should see. And in fact, you do see something like that. So you see a very sharp dispersion of the paramagnet, and then you see some other kind of much more diffuse features in the ordered phase as you go in. And you sort of see that there's a gap that's coming down as you approach the critical point. So it's all consistent with what you expect to see, but there's still some diffuse things that sharpen as you go into the paramagnet. There's actually much more rich detail because of the additional complication. So once I'm, once I go, sorry, I want to go back to this slide. So once I go deep into the ordered phase, when my transverse field is very small, that means that I'm actually, uh, I've got very, very well-defined moments on all the neighboring chains. That's precisely when this interchain effective mean field, which is in the longitudinal direction, becomes important. And that actually means that the domain walls are not free to spread out as much as you'd like. Because imagine that the domain wall is moving. Well, a domain wall lives on one chain, but the neighboring chain points all up. So because of the interchain couplings, it makes a whole bunch of chains unhappy. So that looks like a linear confining potential in which the domain walls have to move. So that actually turns out to be essentially a second year quantum mechanics problem. It's a problem of a pair of particles moving in a linear potential that can be solved by using airy functions. And in fact, you get very precise match by thinking about airy functions. You get a spectrum of bound states, but because the uh, airy potential is only in their relative motion, what you should see is that there's an overall dispersion set by the center of mass. And so what you should see is a whole spectrum of fine grid of bound states. And so what I'm showing here is a theoretical phenomenological model, which uh, the, the sort of color map here on this side is from a theoretical phenomenological model, which is just basically solving two particles with some phenomenological mass in an airy potential. So you can see that it matches the data very well. There's some additional structure near momentum pi, which is basically that uh, there's additional uh, interactions that gave you a bound state where the single spin flip remains bound and is able to hop coherently. And that has to do with the precise momentum balance in a finite real one. So there's some details there, but you can see that this is all captured quite well in very simple effective models. So what you see is that this dispersion I should flag is taken at very small uh, and uh, but it's still um, some substantial interchain coupling comes in. And this is taken at hy equals zero. So this is when I've turned off the transverse field all the way. So I'm really deep in the ordered phase, right? So I'm deep inside the ferromagnet. So this data comes from a very beautiful set of experiments done by my colleague Radu Kolder about 10 years ago. Um, and the real excitement there was that if you think about the Ising model in a longitudinal and a transverse field, and you approach the critical point by taking the longitudinal and the transverse field both to zero, but being finite. So you approach the critical point along the line where you have infinitesimal longitudinal and infinitesimal transverse fields. Uh, so what I mean by that is the transverse field is very close to its critical value and the longitudinal field is very small. So you're very close to the critical point and you have very small perturbations. So you should think of, for those of you who are conformal field theory aficionados, you should think of this as the Ising conformal field theory perturbed, weakly perturbed by the, by the two relevant operators, the magnetization operator, which is conjugate to HZ, and the thermal operator, which is conjugate to HY minus HYC. So that turns out, even though it's not solvable on the lattice, it turns out that the field theory that you get, the Ising conformal field theory is an integrable field theory. And what you find is that that field theory has a very rich particle content. It has eight mesons. In fact, if you go back this airy function spectrum, you can think of as mesons because they're, bound, they're confined bound states of two free excitations in my theory with some hidden structure that has a very sharp prediction. I won't say much about the structure except to say it crucially depends on easing symmetry and it has to do with the uh, exceptional Lie algebra E8. But that's a fancy uh, set of statements. What the really spectacular feature of the structure is it predicts that there are these eight massive excitations and you can look at, so there's some prediction for how, so what I've plotted here is a rough theoretical prediction for how much neutron scattering intensity should go into each of those poles in the neutron scattering spectrum. But these masses are, a, a mass in a field theory is like an energy gap in a scattering experiment, uh, the energy gap at zero wave vector. So what this says is that the energy gap M1 over M2 
uh, has a particular ratio from this E8 structure that's supposed to be the golden ratio, and it should become approach that value as you approach the critical point. So in these experiments, you can look at the peaks in the dam. So this is the K equals zero structure factors. If you go back to the plots I showed you earlier, I'm just taking a vertical cut of the system and just showing uh, along the K equals zero line and just showing you the intensities. And so this is sort of comparable to this plot, of course, broadened because it's a real experiment and not a theoretical dream. And what you see is there's two masses, M1 and M2. This has taken some distance away from the critical point, and this is closer to the critical point. So you can see that these two peaks are moving, and I can infer a mass by just looking at the energy at which this peak happens. And if you look at the ratio of these, you see it approach the golden ratio at the critical point. This is an extremely stringent test of easing criticality, the fact that these masses approach the golden ratio. It's saying that this theory really is the Ising conformal field theory near the critical point, uh, in that it's getting these very high precision predictions are coming, uh, are correct. Right, so it looks like this is a fantastic, you know, textbook example of an easing magnet. We should all declare victory and go home. Uh, Karthik, I think you, did you have a question? You're muted, but you seem like you're saying something. Yeah, so I have a question regarding the, you know, actually interpretation of these excitations. So you had this picture yeah. of a bound pair of kinks, and then there are yeah. some rational states in the kinks, but those will yeah. not. Uh, probably influence the mass of the, you know, the, the, the kind of the translational uh, motion of the yeah. pair of kinks. So why do I even expect different masses and... Oh, no. So when you think about, when I say a mass here, it's like saying you have a dispersion, that there's a rest, a rest energy. It's like omega... So you're really thinking like of omega. this as a gap. Yeah. What? You're really thinking of this as a gap, but... But then the, but uh, besides that, it also change influences the dispersion, like K square over two and the question. Oh yeah, so yeah, that, that's a, so yeah, when I say mass here, it's a very good point. I don't mean the K squared over two M mass. I mean the actual mass in the dispersion. So if you like, this is the bound, the uh, okay. binding energy. Okay. Okay. This is, okay. You should think of this as bind. That's why I was sort of being sloppy. In the picture of few body quantum mechanics, mass is like a rest energy or a binding energy. But if you think about it as a quantum field theory, it's a mass of a, of a collective excitation because it's the K equals zero part. It's right. a good point. It, it's a very, I'm glad you stopped me because it's a, very, it's a point of confusion often and I, I elided that fact. So thanks very much. Great question. Okay. So it, while you think, you know, so this actually brings me up exactly to the question that Karthik asked. So we had very good predictions for this M0 rest mass. But there's also a dispersion. There's a curvature of the dispersion. It's like saying, what is the, you know, I have, uh, I have some mass term here. So this gap is something like M0, but there's also a curvature about the minimum, right? For that curvature is measuring something about the dynamics of the quasi-particles, not just the energy to create them, but how they move. And for that, you need the kinks to be dynamical. So you say, okay, that's fine. I know that kinks move. For instance, I have an HYSY in the problem, and that actually moves kinks. You can convince yourself that that will move kinks around. What it'll do, for instance, HYSY can take this and make it point up, and so that looks like the domain wall hopped one thing, one thing to the right. So domain walls hop by just creating a spin flip at the existing position of a domain wall. That's the easiest thing. That's the lowest energy thing, because to create a spin flip far, far away, you pay twice the energy cost of just moving the domain wall around. So that's the low energy perturbative result. So that sounds nice. Except if I look at the data I showed you earlier, this is just showing it to you again. This was taken as HY goes to zero. I noticed that apart from the masses that we, or the gaps that we talked about, there's also considerable dispersion that we can still see over here. So that tells you, even without this term, the domain wall is moving, right? So you can, it turns out that you cannot explain the dynamics with a leading transverse field using Hamiltonian because the kinks move even though there's no apparent term that lets them move. That's a problem because this is taken at zero field. So earlier people tried to explain it by saying, oh, maybe the field wasn't really aligned. And so, you know, there may be some weak alignment issues. There's some weak transient field. How do you know it's not there? But if you look at all of those qualitative explanations and sort of stress test them, those ideas break down. So first of all, well, as Karthik exactly pointed out earlier, there's two things. You can think about the rest mass, but then there's also the, the dispersion, and there's no explanation of the quasi-particle dispersion. So while there's this beautiful experiment near the critical point, it looks like an Ising CFP, once you go far enough away deep in the ordered phase, one mystery is cropping up. Why does this 
quasi-particle move. There's no reason for it to move, so why is it moving around? A second mystery comes in if I look at the experiments in the other limit. When I look in the ordered phase, uh, in the disordered phase, you expect that a spin flip is a very, very good quasi-particle. It should disperse really nicely and simply. Yes, it does that. You see a nice, you know, this is almost perfectly a cosine K type dispersion. You can even see it sort of curving away and sort of, you know, forming a cosinusoidal pattern and all that. Except right over here, you see this nice whopping breakup of a quasi-particle. So there's a loss of spectral weight at some particular sharp momentum in the Brill-1 zone. And unfortunately, early experiments did this and they thought, oh, it looks like it's at halfway across the Brill-1 zone. But if you actually watch how it evolves in field, Notice that it's not staying at some particular high symmetry momentum. This was here, it's moved now a little bit over here. This was, you know, it's evolving in field and also looks like it's getting sharpened. So there's some field evolution and also the quasi-particle seems to be restored at higher fields. There's some very complicated physics that's going on with the quasi-particle that we don't, really uh, we don't really understand the details. There's a candidate explanation, which is you have a, a quasi-particle state but this has some dispersion. Now, what I, could, what I could imagine is given a single omega of k, so I have an omega of k, so there's an energy momentum relation. So what I can do is given any energy momentum relation, I can build the two part quasi-particle continuum for that energy momentum relation and ask when is the single quasi-particle at what energy and momentum is a single quasi-particle unstable to decay into a pair of quasi-particles? Because after all, this is an interacting field theory, all kinds of things can happen. So, there were proposals. And if you do that argument I gave you, you can see the following. So this I'm drawing a quasi-particle dispersion and then the dots are all the possible two quasi-particle states you can build up from a single quasi, uh, from where each individual quasi-particle follows the black curve. Is it clear what I'm doing? I'm giving you an energy and a momentum and asking, is it possible to create a two quasi-particle state of that energy and momentum. So it's some energy momentum matching thing. In 1D, this can be done quite nicely. You just have to solve uh, two equations and two unknowns, and you can see this is a set of space uh, states for which you have a solution of that. But you can do this more carefully and get a density of states for these things as well. Roughly speaking, you can see that there's a pileup of solutions near the bottom of, uh, and top of this band, and there's less solutions in the middle. That's real. So you look at this and you say, oh, this looks like it. It looks like, oh, this one grazes this one right over here. So maybe what's happening is we're explaining quasi-particle decay. So this was a proposal actually uh, made by my colleague Fabian Essler and Radu Koldea about five years ago. But there were some subtleties there. In order for this quasi, for one, one spin flip to decay into two spin flips, a spin flip has a well-defined Z2 quantum number. So for it to decay, you have to break Ising symmetry which seems completely crazy in the paramagnet. The kinematics of the problem are very fine tuned. So it turns out if you just change it a little bit, these things don't touch anymore. So they require some fine tuning, which seems unnatural. And more detail, if you try and match this experimental evolution with field, it doesn't work. So as you increase the field, you just kill quasi-particle decay completely or get it in the wrong place. So the evolution of the momentum at which the quasi-particle dies doesn't match the experiment at all, right? So something, some, so what it turns out to be the case is when the quasi-particles are critical, we seem to have a very good description when they're gapless, but deep in the uh, regimes where the quasi-particles become gapped, exactly when they're supposed to be very well-defined, simple objects that we should understand well, rather than some horrible critical fluctuating beast, it seems like we have no control over them, right? And in some sense, if we can't understand the quasi-particles of the Ising field theory in the one magnet where we have it, all hope is lost to understand more detailed quasi-particle excitation. So what gives? Why is this, for 10 years, why is there no resolution to this problem? So we got into this problem with my student because we thought this would be a good place to test some you know, BMRG results we were getting. And so we tried to fit this, but then we had no way of understanding. We wanted to play around with microscopic models. And we realized that this, problem hadn't been explained. So Radu told us, well, you know, we have this phenomenology, but it doesn't seem to match the experiments very well at all. So rather remarkably, my student, you know, did something very brave, which I certainly didn't and never did as a student. He faced the dreaded dot, dot, dots that we always put in papers. So he looked at things beyond the leading easing coupling and he said, what can this do? Are they, and you know, usually you think that these can't change the story very much because after all, uh, what is it, uh, what new I physics can we give you? Question. Could you please uh, oh, go sorry. ahead and just unmute yourself and ask the question, whoever raised it. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I just had a question about, um, you're, you're talking about uh, the, the Ising model not matching 
away from the critical yeah. point. I, there yeah. was one variable that, that wasn't that I, I didn't catch at least. Uh, these these experiments are at finite temperature. Is there any influence from this uh, that might? Uh, uh, it's it's a it's a good question. I think that shouldn't be uh, really relevant because deep in the ordered phase, you're uh, you know you have a gap. So deep in either phase, you're gapped. So you have to go to very high temperatures to start seeing corrections from that. At the critical point, you're right that there is a question of should I be able to see criticality because the thermal scale is a cutoff. But these are pretty low temperature experiments. So you know, uh, and the thing is, you're doing scattering. So the thermal scale there, what it's doing is broadening those curves. So at really zero temperature, perfect system, you should see perfect delta function peaks in many cases. The broadening is a correction, but that's controllable. We understand what temperature does. So it kind of broadens some of the peaks, but temperature isn't going to explain things like quasi-particle breakdown. Sure. And I, I guess the only other question from the experimental side would be how clean are the samples? Is it something that... Uh... Um, well, there are samples that you can do neutron scattering on, so the answer is pretty clean. These are big single crystals that you actually see, you know, extremely fine details in neutron scattering. Uh, these are not the samples that, you know, these are not transport samples, right? So these are, you know, high resolution neutron scattering uh, on, you know, magnets. So Radu is probably the one person, one of the few people in the world who can do this kind of experiment. There's a handful of people who can, and they require very, very good uh, samples to do. So they're very good samples. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. So what we want to do is look at the microscopic physics in detail because it's clear that just taking the leading easing coupling isn't going to buy you very much. So let's do that. So it turns out that there's some non-universal features that are still important that you need to get, but you know, there was this kinetic bound state near pi, there was this extra sharpening of the domain wall physics near pi, which you know, all these states became a single nice propagating branch. And there's some gross features. If you try and fit things to a cosine, you realize it's not quite a cosine curve, it needs some corrections. So you get some innocuous curves. You get some second neighbor Z, uh, J, uh, second neighbor ZZ Eisen coupling, and you get an XY coupling. These are all symmetry allowed and so on. But neither of these terms allows domain wall hopping at HY equals zero or quasi-particles decay. Just they don't give you anything. They don't give you the relevant physics, so you can ignore them. They don't do anything for you. The key lies in actually remembering that you're not really looking at a 1D system, you're looking at a quasi 1D system. And the chains are not really one dimensional chains, they have this zigzag pattern. And so if you look at that zigzag pattern, you, you say, suppose I take the zigzag seriously and remember that this site is not strictly equivalent to this site. Then if you say that I want to get domain walls to hop, I want to respect symmetry, but not just pure 1D symmetry, but just the zigzag symmetry, because after all, that's all I'm allowed to demand. You get a unique term allowed in the system, which had been completely missed by previous studies. And this has a really weird form. It's a staggered term, so it alternates signs. So this J, I'm gonna use notation where this is J, this is J plus one, this is J plus two. So you see that even sites and odd sites, uh, even sites live on the zigs and odd sites live on the zags or vice versa, however you want to do it. And the point is this minus one to the J is staggered between those sites. And it's a Z J, uh, it's a Z Y coupling. And this is just by doing crystal symmetry and carefully analyzing all the possible uh, spin rotations. So sort of what Karthik was alluding to right early in the beginning of the talk. This is what he was alluding to that you should do a careful symmetry analysis. This is what it does. So we said, okay, we've got this term. Let's just tune the parameters of this term. All the other parameters you can fix by looking at the critical point, there are models to fix them. So let's just tune this one term and see what it does. And so what I'm showing you now in color is actually just DMRG simulations of a microscopic model and the dots are experimental data. So you see that you get pretty good agreement, right? So you get extremely good agreement at zero transverse field. Notice that you see that the quasi particles uh, dis uh, quasi particles uh, disperse quite nicely over here. You can see there's a quasi particle dispersion. You even get the quantitative features of all the bound states and so on quite clearly. So there is a very clear, concrete, physical, physically sensible thing that we're capturing correctly, all the way up to and including the kinetic bound state. We could probably improve on some of these things by fitting in DMRG. It turns out that's a very numerically very hard thing to do because you have to actually try and fit a structure factor. This is a huge parameter fit and getting one of these structure factors takes a few days of running uh, jobs. So it's not a trivial thing to do. We can improve on it, but already just the first pass gives you something pretty good. Okay, but there's a problem with this explanation. And the problem is if I look at this term, I have a staggering and I have a ZY term. My Ising symmetry is 
basically doing an e to the, uh, I'll just write it down. It's uh, on, sorry, let me. Sorry, did I lose my screen for a second? Yes, uh, we can't see your oh, screen. Sorry, one second. Yeah. That better? You can see it again? Yes, we have it again. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, sort of touched the wrong thing on the display. So what you have is uh, the Ising symmetry was e to the i pi s y j, product over all j. So it's a global flip of all the spins that sends z s z to minus s z, but doesn't leave uh, does this changes s y. So notice that that actually flips the sign of this term, right? So it explicitly breaks Ising symmetry, which I should be sad about because I was claiming there was an Ising critical point. It also explicitly breaks nearest neighbor translation symmetry. That's also a problem because I did all this uh, based on the experiment. And this is very difficult to reconcile with the experiments for the following reason. So let me just introduce some notation. I have a lattice spacing C over here, right? So this is the big lattice spacing and there's a smaller lattice spacing of C over two, right? So if in the experiment, notice that the plots I showed you earlier, I have a, a dispersion that's periodic with a multiple of four pi over C periodicity. Right? You see that the dispersion comes back to itself only at the multiple of four pi over C. Similarly over here, I'm showing half the zone, but if you showed the whole thing, you, could, you would see that this would go off down there and you would get four pi over C periodicity. So it looks like at HY equals zero and in the paramagnet, you see a large Brill one zone, larger than you're allowed based on the fact that this is only translation invariant with the big unit cell. It's as though the model is translation invariant with a small unit cell. That seems a little crazy. So that seems to contradict this fact here, right? The second fact is I explicitly broke a symmetry, but if you explicitly break a symmetry throughout, you shouldn't see a good conformal field theory because you're not actually closing the gap. You go through without a gap closing. So it seems like in trying to fit this small detail, I've completely destroyed the Victoria story I told you earlier. It sounds like everything is lost now. What do I do? So it turns out there's actually a resolution and I never thought this resolution would be actually relevant to anything. So it turned out I talked to my student a little bit about some ideas I had on non-symorphic symmetries and magnets, something that I've uh, symmetries and crystals. And he pointed out that actually that could explain everything. And so let me just tell you what that symmetry is. So this term is not invariant under a translation and it's not invariant under a uh, translation by C tilde, which I'm gonna define here. So it's not invariant under an operation that you know, moves this site to this site. That's clear that the system isn't invariant. And it's not invariant under a global flip of all the spins. But if I do those two operations together, the system is invariant. And that's basically saying if I, uh, that's another way of saying that is if I take a zigzag chain, move it from here to here, I'll convert it to a picture that looks like that. But then if I reflect it, I get back to the original picture. So that's the glide operation. I just have to be careful to do it also in spin space as well as in real space. And if I do that, I actually recover exactly, the Hamiltonian is invariant under this operation. You can check all the other terms are invariant as well. So what does that buy for me? Well, it turns out that generically, these glide symmetries allow you to unfold a small Brill one zone into a large Brill one zone. You can either, when you have a glide symmetry, you can either work with a two band model in a small Brill one zone, or work with a one band model in a big real one zone. You usually can't do this because of the fact that you'd get a break in the two band model. Uh, in, uh, you'd get a, the, two band, the two bands are separated by a gap, so you can't smoothly unwrap it into a single Brill one zone. It's like saying, if these things were gapped and I tried to write it in a full Brill one zone, I would get a picture that looks like this, which doesn't make much sense as a single smooth dispersion. Only if they're gapless can I unwrap into a single smooth dispersion. And it turns out glide symmetries are precisely things that protect uh, zone boundaries from being gapped out. So it means that I can think of, I'm allowed to think about the smaller, Brill one, the big Brill one zone associated with this, just as well as the small Brill one zone associated with the bigger unit cell. So they're interchangeable because of the glide symmetry. And this is something we've pointed out in old papers for electronic structure. So when the glide is unbroken, the dynamic structure factor sees a large Brill one zone. The Ising order, so that explains what happens in the quasi, uh, in, the, in the paramagnetic phase. So the quasi particles there see a large Brill one zone because they don't know about the glide symmetry being broken. 
the Ising order parameter breaks the glide symmetry spontaneously. Since there's still a symmetry to be broken, and I'm going to argue that this gives you the, exactly the same conformal field here. I'll show you in a second. Um, so let's see why that works. So what I can do, presented with a Hamiltonian like this, I can sort of make it, my life a little bit easier by doing the following. I take the original problem and do the following unitary transformation. All it amounts to saying is I flip the sign of the Ising axis on every other sulk. So what does that do to my problem? Well, the domain wall term now becomes translationally invariant, but it breaks Ising symmetry. It still breaks Ising symmetry because it has just SY in it and SZ, SY. And so that changes sign under the Ising symmetry. The other couplings are all translationally invariant with respect to the small unit cell, but you change the model from being a ferromagnet to an anti-ferromagnet because SZJ, SZJ plus one will flip sign under a transformation like this. Also, HZ now becomes a staggered field. So that tells you this, that's just saying that if I stagger with the order parameter, then the near, nearby chain will couple to it with the staggered order parameter. That, does, that shouldn't change anything. So what I get is an Ising antiferromagnet in a transverse field plus a staggered longitudinal field with a term that in the domain wall that explicitly breaks an Ising symmetry. The key thing about the Ising antiferromagnet that makes it different from the Ising ferromagnet is that the order parameter in an Ising ferromagnet uh, and an Ising antiferromagnet actually breaks two symmetries. It breaks Ising Z2 symmetry, but it also breaks translation by a lattice spacing because it goes up, down, up, down. This domain wall term in the rotated language, so H twiddle, which is in the unitarily transformed domain wall term, breaks the Ising Z2, but preserves translation. So the translation is still a, in this language, there is still a symmetry that exists to be spontaneously broken. And in fact, you can do a very, there's a, there's a beautiful paper that shows how if you take the easing antiferromagnet and apply, for instance, a longitudinal field, it still has a quantum phase transition because a longitudinal field does not couple to the order parameter of translational symmetry breaking. That's translationally invariant. So there's a hidden symmetry in the problem. So it turns out that even though people had thought about this as being an Ising ferromagnet, it, the better way to think about it is a hidden Ising antiferromagnet. That explains a lot of the physics. But what that tells you what's happening to the ordered phase is the spontaneous doubling of a unit cell. And this is also in the Ising universality class. That can be uh, shown there. in 1D. If you think of unit cell doubling, that's a Z2 breaking transition also in the Ising universality class. Near the quantum critical point, it should be described as the Ising conformal field theory, but by a magnetization and a thermal operator. And that's because this is exactly the field that coupled, this staggered field exactly couples to a translational symmetry breaking order parameter. So that's like the magnetization operator of the Ising model. And the thermal operator acts the same way. So this also explains why you get the eight structure. Having understood all of this, I can just undo the unitary and ask, what does the translational symmetry breaking in the rotated language mean in the original language where you know, the model had whatever symmetry it had? It turns out it maps to the breaking of this glide symmetry. So this gives you a precise reason for why breaking of glide symmetry is described by an Ising quantum critical point. So in some sense, this actually resolves the puzzle. So you know, something that people never, you know, the kind of thing that never makes it into a, the famous science papers is, is this actually expected phenomena that you should be seeing? And nobody had given a compelling reason why a non-Kramer's magnet with all these potentially relevant couplings should really have an Ising critical point. It could be that it was just a very, very sharp crossover with a very small gap that the experiments didn't resolve and there would have been an extra complication there. I think we've provided definitive evidence that there's a reason for why there is a sharp quantum critical point in that material. So that's a nice sort of corollary because it's nothing to do with magnetism. It's really hidden uh, space group symmetry breaking that's built into this problem through the magnetic order. Okay, so the other piece of physics, which is very interesting, is if I look at this term, it has a minus one to the J, but it also has an SJ, uh, uh, Z, SZJ. So an SZ allows two quasiparticles to decay, uh, to transition into one quasiparticle. So a one spin flip can decay into two spin flips, which is exactly what I wanted, but they can only do it by changing momentum by pi. So they can only do it by an umklapp process. So what that means is that when I drew these pictures of matching the dispersion of a single quasiparticle and then building the two quasiparticle continuum, that was the correct thing to do, except that I should have shifted the continuum by a factor of pi to look at the allowed decay. There's a hidden pi, there's a hidden 
a pi momentum in the matrix element that allows the quasi-particle to decay. The two quasi-particles interact, but then the, they get kicked by the interaction across the Bill 1 zone, and then they can decay. So it turns out, if I actually draw the two-particle continuum and see where it lines up, and look at the evolution of the two-particle continuum with respect to the one-particle spin-flip branch, you actually see that it exactly agrees with the experiment. But of course, now that we have a microscopic model, you don't need to take some kinematic word for it. You can actually just simulate it. So this is the experiment I showed you earlier, and this is numerical simulations. So you see that you get pretty precise agreement, uh, including things like the feature getting restored as you go to higher field. And this is no free parameters in this fit. Everything was fit in the low field phase, and we just said, run the code at high field at, high uh, at seven tesla. This is a zero free parameter fit of an interacting many body system simulating quasi-particle decay. I have a, so a quick nice... question, do you mind? Yes, Tony. Um, so in the experimental data, there's this faint dispersion in um, yellow. Uh, is that kind of a high yes. shifted zone? Yes, so it actually turns out we have a beautiful explanation. That drove us a bit crazy. So what happens there is experiments cannot align perfectly with the axis. So all the pictures I told you about have to do with I'm assuming the scattering wave vector, it's as though I'm scattering a one-dimensional beam. That makes sense if I can align my scattering beam K right on the quasi-particle. But of course, you can't actually do that. Your, your beam is going to be slightly aligned off the C-axis. It turns out if your neutron scattering beam Hits the, hits the chain a little bit off axis, then the matrix elements in the scattering break the glide symmetry and make a piece of the, the dynamic structure factor visible. So the shadow mode has to do with the fact that your probe is breaking the symmetry of the dispersion and giving you some structure coming back from the other side. So it turns out there's a precise prediction for how this mode will evolve. There's some cosine of the rocking angle kind of prediction that we can exactly match as well. We haven't shown it to you here, but we can actually show uh, how if your beam is misaligned a little bit, as you turn the, uh, if you turn the crystal a little bit away from the perfect C-axis alignment that was hopefully there for this experiment, you can see that this will get restored and you'll rotate all the way until this thing goes over here. So it's really saying that as you rotate the beam away, some of the spectral weight goes into that. There's literally some cosine theta, sine theta type angle of kinematics that goes into that. Thanks. Yeah, so great question. So that mode drove us crazy, but there's a very crisp explanation for that. Sid, could you uh, try and wrap up in like five to eight minutes? Yeah, so I think I went a bit slower than I expected, but I think uh, I can probably do that in eight minutes is probably good because the second part is much more speculative. So I'll just do that. So one thing I would say is, you know, if you go back, I said that the Ising order parameter breaks the glide symmetry, but exactly at HY equals zero, it turns out there's an accidental symmetry that means that the dynamic structure factor there cannot see the breaking of the glide symmetry. There's another thing that means that the glide symmetry breaking is invisible in the particular components of the, that the DSF measures. But for any HY not equal to zero, you expect some unit cell doubling or Brill 1 zone halving to be seen. And you can sort of see that. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the great, great details of this. The only thing I want you to take away is that it, it seems like everything is continuous with 2 pi over c periodicity here. If you look at this and do it carefully, you can show that 2 pi over c periodicity explains everything. The reason that you don't see it so clearly here is that there's an extra form factor effect that masks that, but you can show that everything is well understood in this limit. So this is just to show that we understand the ordered phase. You can see that theory and simulation match quite in quite precise details, but there's a complex structure that's not fully understood yet. But now that we have a microscopic model, we can ask what this tower of quasi-particle states is really doing in this problem. So I'm a little slower than I expected, but basically what I've tried to get across is that you have this Ising chain material with a field tuned quantum critical point uh, with long, basically the Ising model in longitudinal and a transverse field. And you can probe the quasi-particle spectrum of these sort of interacting 1D quantum field theories uh, at criticality where the theory is gapless and the gap QFT is on either side. So you get this E8 structure near criticality, but more detailed physics in the phases that we should understand really well, which is the ordered and the disordered phases where the quasi-particles are nominally very simple, actually tell us that there's a hidden symmetry at work in the problem with rather different kinematics and different symmetries. And this is an example of how, if you like, the key thing here is that the topological defects of the Ising order parameter actually carry a crystal symmetry because they're breaking glide, uh, uh, you know, the Ising, or, uh, Ising magnet is spontaneously breaking translational symmetry. So these things carry a crystal momentum with them. And that 
changes their physics completely. That controls how they decay as quasi particles and so on. So, uh, if you want to more, have more details, it's summed up in this paper, which is just about to appear. Um, so, in the last, I guess, seven or eight minutes, let me just tell you something very brief, uh, which is, I think, actually simpler because there's not as much uh, experiment in it. It's just a theoretical speculation, but it's an interesting theoretical speculation, I think. So, the setting I'm talking about is Moiré graphene. I'm sure many of you have seen lots of talks on it, so I'm not going to give you a, a precis of the whole field. Basic idea is that you have two graphene monolayers that are twisted at a small angle. And the conspiracy of having linearly dispersing electrons with an interlayer coupling uh, means that you get mini bands. The mini bands are uh, because of the fact that the two, when you rotate two sheets, there's a moiré pattern, which is because of the uh, mismatch of the uh, lattice vectors of the two sheets. And you get a dispersion that depends on the angle between them. And a lot of excitement came from the fact that near a special magic angle of about a degree, and a, uh, just over one degree, you see that the bands near charge neutrality are extremely flat. And it turns out when you get very flat bands, then you can imagine that electron correlations play a, uh, a disproportionately big role. And indeed, beautiful experiments by, um, by Herla Herrera's group at MIT uh, foresaw a prediction by Bistritzer and McDonald that said that uh, they should be interesting physics. And indeed, they found kind of resemblances to the high TC phase diagram. Although since then, there's a lot more understood. And maybe the early comparisons to high TC are not so interesting. In some sense, I'm going to make, uh, talk about a comparison to a very different correlated phenomenon, which is the quanta, quantum Hall effect. So it turns out that if you take these twisted bilayer graphenes and align them on a hexagonal boronitride substrate, that actually makes the problem both simpler and more difficult. What it does is, you know, these moiré bands are, there are eight bands in this low energy subspace. They come, uh, four of that, fourfold degeneracy comes from spin and microscopic valley. So microscopic valley has to do with the valleys of the original graphene sheets nothing to do with uh, the moiré brillouin zone, and that's a U1 symmetry. You have spin rotations. That gives you another two flavors. That's four. But then you get a conduction and a valence band that are glued together at Dirac points. That's how you get eight bands in this picture. And th that gluing together is a topological restriction but that uh, with symmetries, but that symmetry is broken by the HBN substrate. So that actually splits into four bands above the neutrality and four bands below neutrality. And so the bands above neutrality have spin and valley, and below neutrality have spin and valley. And this twisted bilayer graph, this H HBN substrate is imparting a churn number to the bands. These bands become topological, but the churn numbers are linked to the valleys so that time reversal is preserved. So the two valleys of the microscopic problem map into each other on the time reversal. So one of them gets churn number one, and the other gets churn number minus one in its conduct. Uh, for the, uh, for the bands below charge neutrality, and the assignment is reversed above charge neutrality. So there's this sort of structure, so I've kind of sketched it here. So, I'm, uh, so you have spin up and down, so that's on this axis. You have churn number assignments plus and minus one, and you have two valleys. So of the eight bands, uh, below charge neutrality, you have, notice that valley K always has churn number minus one, and valley K bar has churn number plus one. Okay, so why is this interesting? Well, these are very flat bands. And if I have enough electrons to fill, say, an odd number of these, well, what happens is that interactions will lift the flat band degeneracy. You can think of this as quantum hall ferromagnetism or a version of a stoner instability because you have a flat density of state. So there's a density of state singularity. And so whenever there's an odd filling, what you're going to do, let's ignore these. I'm not, I'm not worried about what's happening above the Fermi energy. I imagine these four bands are degenerate. Whenever there's an odd filling, there's a spontaneous time reversal breaking because you have to either choose to fill one valley K or valley K bar, but they have opposite churn numbers. So you'll spontaneously break time reversal and get an orbit, what people call an orbital churn insulator. Orbital because it has to do with the electron motion in the crystal, not to do with any uh, external Zeeman physics or external magnetism that you're imposing. And it has a quantized anomalous Hall response that's been measured by various groups. So this shows RXY uh, and there's a field put on just to allow you to measure it, but what you can see is quite sharp uh, pictures where you get an orbital churn insulating state. So what's very interesting in these orbital churn insulating states is that if you look at their particle hole excitations, um, they can form a bound state because I just, you know, I have two very non-dispersing states. I've got a particle and a hole with Coulomb interactions. They can form a tightly bound state. 
but it's like you have an electron in a positive magnetic field forming a bound state with a hole in a negative magnetic field. So that object, if you think about it, even though it's neutral, we'll see a net magnetic field. And you see that is a very simple argument. If I have an electron in a hole in the same magnetic field, you ask about the Lorentz force. Well, the Lorentz force on the electron um, will be, so if I try to take this bound state and move it, so imagine they form a bound state and it tries to move in this direction. Well, the Lorentz force in the electron uh, points this way and the Lorentz force in the hole points that way. There's no net Lorentz force because the neutral object, that's what you expect. And so this means that a, a bound state like this sees no magnetic field and it moves like a neutral particle in zero field. So this can Bose condense and do various things. It's a bound state of two electrons. It's a boson, it can Bose condense. And this is where people think about exciton superfluids and things like that in the high field quantum hole problem. Here though, you have a different problem because when you go from an electron to a hole, you change the sign of the magnetic field. And so if you do that same calculation, you form a bound state and try to move, you have a neutral object, but because it's, when you switch the charge, you also switch the sign of the field, there's a net Lorentz force on this neutral object. And so what you find is that, you know, you can make a lowest Landau level type approximation. What you find is that you get Landau levels off these excitonic states. So rather than being a boson as neutral object in a vanishing magnetic field, you get a neutral object in a net magnetic field. And so there's a rich phenomenology that comes out of that. And of course, when you actually uh, try to do this in a band, this is more complicated. You have to think about different contributions to the Berry curve, which is not just Landau levels anymore. But in fact, you can show that by doing realistic models for HBN on TB, this is true microscopic at the level of doing full Hartree Fock, including all the thousands of, you know, 200 bands below the Fermi energy and doing careful calculations. You find that depending on the strength of the substrate coupling, you can actually get these topological churn bands. So you find that there's a neutral collective excitation whose dispersion is controlled by a churn number. And so that's an exciting thing because you've just created a boson in a lattice system, there's a stable bosonic excitation that's got, uh, it's gapped, but it's stable, um, a bosonic bound state that has Barry curvature. So this can lead you to speculate interesting things. So let me just say one interesting speculation we came up with, and I'll just stop with this, is that what you have is interacting neutral bosons in an effective field. And if you think about what neutral bosons can do if they have strong repulsive interaction in an effective field, Actually, Laughlin and Halper announced that. They pointed out that the quantum Hall effect, once you, you know, are not worried about integer quantum Hall and start, start talking about interactions, well, then the quantum Hall effect can also occur for bosons. And at finite density, you can ask whether you get incompressible fractional quantum Hall states. And so it turns out that the kind of states that you need, I won't go into this, there's probably too much to squeeze in. It turns out that you can think of them as uh, you form a very tightly bound boson, and then that tightly bound boson forms a Laughlin-like state. And actually preliminary numerics suggest that this can win over fully polarized states in a Landau level approximation. We're trying to do much more detailed things that take into account the imperfections of a churn band, but these are tricky and very complicated many body calculations. But the phenomenology of these things is quite interesting because nothing in the existing experiments uh, suggests that these are not the states that are seen. All that experiments measure are the quantized Hall response and for this state, you would see that it has exactly the same quantized Hall response. Where it disper uh, differs is in its thermal response. And so that nobody has measured, but there's a sharp signature of a state that could be consistent with existing experiments. That's in fact a very exotic, many body quantum Hall state of bosons. As an alternative to some uh, sort of trivial quantum Hall insulator, it's an excitonic Laughlin state. So basically I went through this very quickly, but I think the thing I wanted to get across is that uh, you know, the more, these Moray systems have a nice feature that they have flat bands. So there's a lot of room for correlations, but they also uh, have these sort of topological underpinnings, particularly when placed on a substrate. And so this assignment of valley in that the slaving of the valley degrees of freedom to a churn number allows you to think about new states of matter, because what you can do is create bosonic bound states of a correlated, in, uh, excitations of a correlated insulator that are themselves uh, now these are excited states, right? So an exciton is a neutral particle hole bound state of this correlated insulator. And now I'm talking about the topology of those correlated excitations of the system. And so, you know, people have talked about exciton Berry curvature before. It's a sort of actually, I believe that one of the early works, uh, colleagues of a former colleague at McGill, Ashish Clerk, had worked on things to do with excitonic Berry curvature. There's some papers of his as well. 
Um, so this is something that's an old uh, subject. What's interesting here is the fact that uh, you can think of this as coming out of an intrinsic correlation effect, which means the scales are quite different from the standard uh, sort of free particle band structure. And there's sort of substantial things, including the fact that the excitonic bands are essentially flat because of the flatness of the underlying quasi-particle bands. And so there's an example of how the topology of quasi-particle bound states can point to new phenomena. So that was a lot less on firm footing than the rest of the talk in the sense that there isn't an experiment yet, but there's a hope that new experiments might see such interesting physics. Uh, thanks so much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sid, for that uh, very uh, interesting talk. We are above uh, uh, time, so if, you know, I mean, you can ask as many questions, uh, just raise your hands and unmute, uh, but uh, I, you know, you're all people who have to go are free to go, obviously. All right, questions? Sorry for being a bit over. Always hard to judge. Uh, so, okay, so I guess I can ask a question. Um, so mm -hmm. can we go back to the um, uh, plot you had of the single particle uh, mode going through the, you know, two particle continuum. Um, yeah. Yes, right. Sir. So, yeah. you know, you, you show that basically this single particle mode where, it, when it hits the two particle continuum, it has a loss in spectral weight. Yeah. But the question is now that it's completely submerged in this two particle continuum, unless I've got it incorrect, why yeah. doesn't this weight, uh, you know, go away all the way inside? Yeah. So the reason is actually, it's a great question. So I know that, that was my initial thing as well, but this has been studied quite a bit. So remember I said that the two particle continuum has a density of states. So notice that there's many more, if you actually count, right? The reason we drew it this way was these are supposed to give you an idea of real plot. So what we did was discretize this dispersion and look at all, for a given discretization of this dispersion, we said, what are all the possible solutions here? That gives you a sense of the two particle density of states, right? So if you see more crosses, it means the density of states is quite big. Mm -hmm. So notice that there's a pileup of density of states here because there's sort of like a symmetry reason why there's two-fold degeneracy along these curves. So notice there's some extra density of states here. And there's a real pileup of density of states near the bottom, right? Can you see that the crosses are getting closer? Mm -hmm. So this is like saying, you know, there's a, so the key thing here is that you have to do a perturbation theory calculation for a decay rate of this guy, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a matrix element and there's an energy denominator and then you, know, you do a golden rule calculation. Uh, it's not an energy denominator. There's a matrix element and there's the density of states. Right. The matrix element is tiny, right? The matrix element is tiny, so you shouldn't actually see decay. I mean, there's decay, but it's almost invisible because you see that the overall scale of this is set by H and J. So, you know, the reason this moves is the kinetic part of this is set by J, right? So J is, let's say J is order one the decay term is 1% uh, between one and 10% of J. Mm. Somewhere like, you know, say three, 4%, something in that range, right? I don't remember the numbers offhand. So it's not gonna decay. You can't see the decay. Thermal broadening is bigger than the decay that you would see, except if the density of states compensates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you like, you know, you're just saying it's, you know, it's just basically, this is the golden rule calculation, right? right. So you have two pi over H bar, and then mm -hmm. you have your two QP uh, H domain wall, one QP, right? Right, right. You're doing Got this it. square times rho of 2QP because the density of final states is what matters. Mm -hmm. So this rho of 2QP has a one over square root E singularity near the E minus E cutout, e, e, EC, where EC is this threshold thing. So you mm -hmm. can only, you don't decay, you, you naively say, yes, you could decay everywhere here, but your decay rate is so small, except just as you enter, because there, there's a density of states effect that gets you. Right, got, got you, okay. Um, us, uh, so I think Ben, uh, also had a question. Ben, uh, could you, uh, uh I, I just had myself confused. It's, it's all cleared up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I have, uh, one more quick question about the, sure. the second part. So, mm -hmm. um, you talked about the flat bands. Is that unique to graphene or it's just because the unit cell becomes really large in the Mora pattern and you fold many so, times? I think it's not just that. So I think you're, you're right. I think it, it, there may be other things where you get sort of flat-ish bands, but I think the particular structure in graphene, at least I don't see a simple explanation for other things. So the way I understand the thing in graphene is the fact that 
first order perturbation theory is linear in the perturbation and the dispersion is linear. That my simplest explanation for the flat bands is, you know, what you're doing is doing nearly free Dirac electrons. You start with a Dirac point here, you start with a Dirac point here. So this is, you know, your la top layer and this is your bottom layer of your Dirac points. And they're rising by a certain amount, right? This point where they meet is when you're doing zone folding because you're sort of saying you, you rise, you meet at the corner and you do perturbation theory. So this is something like, if you like, it's like the Dirac point times theta, right? So that's basically uh, this distance is Dirac point times theta. And if you look at this energy, you've just gone VF KD times theta, right? So this is why the magic angle is given very simply by this thing. So if this is of order T perp, which is the interlayer coupling, right? You just push it back down by exactly how much it came up. So theta is just, in fact, this is exactly the precise thing for the magic angle, right? More or less, that sets the magic angle. It, this is roughly a prediction of the magic angle. Why it's 1.05 degrees, this gives you a pretty good estimate. So to me, the linearity is important in that kind of simplistic explanation. I think the incommensuration is important for the following reason. You want incommensuration so that, uh, or you know, the Moray pattern so that only one dominant wave vector matters and all the other ones can be thrown out. So when you do the nearly free electron calculation, you can sort of just keep the dominant terms and all the other ones die out quickly. Uh, so you want some large separation of scales and momentum space. But I think you don't get nearly as rich physics for other Moiré systems. You get some version of flatness. I think the careful analysis of this was done by Ashwin has a paper with uh, his student Cariado that looks at all possible Bravi lattices and does some considerations on where this can happen. So I think that's the place to look for a sharp statement of this. But to me, linearity is sort of important. The other thing that sort of doesn't get mentioned a lot is, you know, somehow in graphene, the correct picture seems to be, for whatever reason, seems to be much closer to thinking about Landau level like flat bands. Whereas if you take TMDs and rotate them, it seems a lot more like you get some sensible Hubbard model with a very large U kind of relative to T kind of thing. You know, there are two ways you can think about narrow bands, right? One way is think of like a magnetic field and then narrow bands with narrow kinetic bands. And then you can think of narrow bands just because the electrons form sharp local moments that disperse very weakly. And they're not that different. It's just that if you're closer to the graphene limit, it means that there isn't some simple nearest neighbor Hubbard model. It's some very complicated Hubbard description. So it's better to think about it in terms of more like itinerant electrons because it's you know the, the higher neighbor interactions are so important that itineracy seems relevant to them but, but once sense. you get uh, these flat bands does it matter that uh, i mean we talked about chirality and all that is it really yeah. important that i start with a material that has uh very curvature so i think uh it's not entirely obvious to me that it is important. I think the here, the thing that was important is that I started with a, a system that, so I think certainly the mechanism in graphene is important because in order to make the bands churn bands, I had to have a direct point to gap out, right? So that was important. So if you like, um, in, in some sense, uh, the null result is the statement that you were saying. So if you actually start off with a naive problem and calculate the exciton bands, once you go to a complicated interacting problem, the band structure, there's so many com uh, contributions to the excitonic very curvature that even though naively by looking at the single particle bands, you know, one is churn number minus one, the other is churn number one, if they were flat in the idealized limit, that has to have a very curvature. There's no doubt that it does. But the actual details of the problem mean that there's a kind of envelope function, how it evolves the real ones and all these details can conspire to cancel the very curvature in a realistic model. I think that's the other, so you can get other answers, but the basic result requires you to really start off with, uh, you know, if you want a kind of basic reason for it to happen, you need to have the direct point structure that was inherited from the topology of graphene to go all the way to when you open it up to give you these uh, churn number plus and minus one. Now, it seems to be the case that even if you didn't put on uh, this substrate potential, there's some speculation that the system can spontaneously, you know, after all, a substrate potential is just some two-body Hartree-Fock term. So you could argue the system spontaneously chooses that two-body term when it opens a gap. But it's just that the substrate potential, you should think of it as something that's like, I, I think of it more as a field that's teasing out some underlying susceptibility of the system because, you know, there are many competing states when you don't put it on the substrate, the substrate just helps it decide, but it's incipient already without the substrate. So in fact, you know, we have Hartree-Fock you can do, which, and many people have got the same results in their Hartree-Fock. When you do the calculations, uh, 
And by the way, Hartree-Fock is pretty damn good for these problems. It works pretty well. When you do the numerics, what you find is even without a substrate, when the Dirac points haven't gapped out, so you don't have this nice, you know, pretty assignment I gave you here of, you know, uh, this nice assignment requires you to have a substrate. If you don't have a substrate, I can't separate out the bands. There's sort of pairs of bands that are glued together. Even if you start off with that and you work at the right filling, many cases you find that the stable Hartree-Fock state is to spontaneously break time reversal and generate, effectively generate a substrate mass on its own. Yeah. So, so, but I think the graphene band structure is important to all of that. I, I am not aware of anything else having similar things, but it need not be graphene period. So monolayer bilayer graphene has a lot of similar physics as does double bilayer. So the precise churn numbers and things change, but they have similar structure. Yeah. yeah. So I have one last very quick question. Uh, so it is uh, clear or known from some modeling that the substrate potential doesn't actually just end up you know, annihilating the churn numbers. Like it just gaps it out, but it doesn't actually mix them so strongly that you know, the whole thing just go to, goes to C equals to zero C equals to zero. Like, I'm not sure what it means by gap. So there's no notion of a churn number for these bands before you turn on the substrate. So right. what the substrate is doing is, a, so it depends on exactly how you couple the substrate in, but the model is that you know, the substrate picks one sublattice on one side over the other side. If you do that, you know, because HBN is not lattice matched, right? So what you're doing is aligning HBN with the sub with one side of the sheet. So it's it's mm -hmm. it's aligned substrate. If you just drop it on HBN and you moire HBN against it, you don't get this effect. Mm -hmm. So you know, the early sample, so it should be more clear, it's not just graphene on HBN. I think I might have mis mistaken that on the slide. Um, it's it should be aligned with an HBN substrate. If I just drop it on HBN without alignment, I don't do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I just you know isolate the system because it sort of cancels out. So mm -hmm. that there's a gap opening effect. To get a gap opening effect, I have to sort of coherently do it. So one of the layers is really sitting, it's kind of registering roughly with the substrate. It can't be perfectly matched because HBN has a 2% lattice mismatch with the carbon carbon, but you know, it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. okay. Right? So there's sort of a and that's important. And that just that's at the seated at the level of the individual graphene, and then that conspires with the moray coupling to do this. Right. Okay. Th there is a limit where you can get churn number zero as well. So there's a sort of phase diagram of if you go substrate on the top and the bottom, they're competent. There's a nice phase diagram in a paper. The same paper I stole this from, which is a paper of Zalatel's, I uh, has that uh, picture. Yeah, you can see the full phase diagram of where this happened. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's all the questions. And so again, let's thank uh, Sid. I, uh, for the very nice talk. Um, and uh, right, thank you, Sid. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Sid, um, do you have maybe just 10 minutes? Can I ask you a couple of questions about the, the, the slide? Sure. Uh, maybe, the, maybe we could turn off the recording, though. <laughs> you mentioned this is not, it can be sort of air quotes. <laughs> I know that everything, I, yeah. I don't. So,